Hello, and welcome to those of you who have joined us. Welcome to the third of the Road Ahead series um, on LinkedIn. Uh, so previously, we've explored the cost of roadway accidents and preventative measures to reduce fatalities and financial strain, as well as how pavement friction management can proactively reduce or prevent roadway crashes. So leading on from those previous discussions, we're going to give, dig a little bit deeper into how legislation and data analysis are key to future proofing the nation's infrastructure as critical components in creating safer and more resilient road networks across the United States. My name is Abby Park. I'm the marketing manager at WDM Limited and based in the UK. I'll be moderating today's discussion. I'm joined today by our guest, Andrew Stasiowski, President and CEO of the American Highway Users Allowance, an organization which many of you know is committed to improving road safety and the efficiency of highway performance. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. And can you tell us a little bit more about the work of the organization? And also, I think you've got a podcast in the pipeline that maybe you'd like to talk about as well. Yeah, thank you, Abby. Um, yeah, my name is Andrew Stasiowski. I'm the president and CEO of the American Highway Users Alliance. Uh, we're an organization that represents basically all users of the highway from, you know, trucking companies to manufacturers to um, suppliers to, you know, materials companies. Um, and, you know, we're really just focused on making sure we're investing in highways, uh, we're prioritizing uh, roads and bridges that create safer road environments for our drivers and our commercial drivers. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're seeing a lot of, of uh, investment in roads and bridges with the IIJA that I know we're going to talk about a little more. But um, as, I also, as you also said, we are starting a podcast. We're going to call it Driving Forward, which is what our, um, our, you know, our news magazine is already called. And we're going to just talk about different aspects of the highway system and what the highway users members are doing and how, you know, we can find good policies to promote uh, our big goals of a robust, safe and efficient highway system. That sounds great, Andrew. Thank you. That's something for everyone to look out for then, yeah. uh, that podcast coming up. Yeah, we're hoping um, to get that soon. Fantastic. Brilliant. We'll look out for it. Yeah. Um, so joining Andrew is Ryland Potter, Vice President of Business Development at WDM USA. Thanks for joining us, Ryland. She is an advocate for extolling the safety benefits of continuous friction measurement of the road surface. And she has been key in educating the industry about the benefits of data analysis that can inform accident prevention measures with increasing success over the last four years. Ryland, thanks for joining us. I know you've had some technical difficulties today, so uh, hopefully they're solved now. Um, and I, I know that WDM, we've recently joined the Highways Users Allow Alliance. Can you kind of tell us a little bit more about why you made that decision? Yeah, Abby, it's it's good to be with you. Again, technical difficulties or no, at least I'm not in a car this time. Um, and it's great to join you, Andrew, to uh, to talk about safe road safety, um, something that's uh, key to the mission of both our groups. Um, as Andrew said, the highway users are a really diverse group. Um, but where I've connected with the mission is the idea of a safe and effective road network that embraces safety as inseparable from operation. Um, it's a purpose-driven view and a policy-driven view. And I found that the highway users are a place where new ideas can find an audience. Um, I've really appreciated Andrew's partnership since we joined, as well as his, exp his expertise on how legislation can provide meaningful change. That well, sounds great. Glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you, Ryland. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, so to start the discussion today, um, just kind of going back to our previous live streams, a bit of a theme throughout the series has been to reference a study published in 2023 by 2023 by the National Highways Traffic Safety Administration, which suggests traffic crashes in the US cost $340 billion in 2019. Now that equates to $1,000 for each of the country's 328 million people. So working on reducing that enormous cost will take both financial investment and strong thought leadership, one which emphasizes the importance of improving road safety, which will in turn provide a more efficient and effective highway network. So I guess this takes us to the first topic we're going to discuss today. Um, the IIJA. So in November 2021, 
the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the IIJA, was passed. It called for $621 billion of spending on transportation infrastructure, which included $115 billion towards highways and roads. Following this apparently considerable investment, I'd like to ask the panel how they think the IIJA has impacted the highways network over the last 20 months. So what's impacted the spend thus far and what opportunities are there to optimise the spend moving forwards? Um, so we're going to come to both of you, but I'd like to start with Andrew. Over to you first, please. Yeah, appreciate that. I mean, I think the IIJA, I think we all would agree, represented, you know, kind of a, a, a massive investment. Um, you know, I think we increased spending by about 38 um, percent over the FAST Act, or the, uh, the FAST Act, which is the previous highway bill. Um, and I think that this we looked at this as a way not only to, to maintain current projects and keep funding projects we're doing, but also to fund big projects. Um, I, I think of the, the Spence Bridge in Louisville um, as a or not, not Louisville, Cincinnati as one of the big ones. But, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, I think where we've kind of bogged down a little bit is you know we get all, we've gotten a lot of projects out there but we haven't really started funding them and starting those processes um and i think that one of the things we've learned at least initially and there's a lot of talk about in dc is the need for permitting reform um and i think you know the application process is the application process i think states have a lot of you know understanding of how they can you know submit projects to dot for approval but I think we're always getting slowed down by the permitting process. It takes it used to take 15 years to get a project from kind of idea to shovels in the ground. We've worked on that to get that quicker um, and getting projects started faster, but we're still really slow to getting projects started. And inflation um, has cut a huge away from a huge part of the increased funds from this. I think inflation is up about 37% in the transportation sector. So 38% increase in funding versus 37% increase in inflation, it's really hurt, hurt our ability to, to start these projects. So, you know, as states are dealing with this, as the feds are dealing with this, you know, permitting reform, getting these projects started faster, I think is our best effort in terms of getting projects started for the driving public. Thank you. Um, thanks for that, Andrew. So I'll just hand over to you, Ryland, to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, it, as Andrew said, you know, any investment of this magnitude is going to have its own set of unintended and unanticipated consequences. Um, and since appropriations this year isn't fully set, some of those consequences going into fiscal year 24 are unknown. Um, you know, on the good side of the ledger, the proposed funding for some of the highway safety programs, you know, the Title uh, 23, 402, um, and Section 405 National Party Safety Programs uh, are expected to see a slight increase over uh, fiscal year 23 if the, if the House Republicans bill is anything to judge by, um, despite kind of an overall uh, dramatic 25% uh, cut in, in current funding levels. Um, most of those cuts come at the expense of new safety enabling grant programs like the RAISE grant, um, which could see a, an $800 million uh, FY23 appropriation zeroed out. Um, but, you know, for those who have managed to get safety projects out to bid, you know, cost inflation for delivering those projects has become a, a significant issue as well. Um, so, you know, to, to kind of put a number on that inflation, I think nationwide, an estimated uh, $24 billion or so in highway funding uh, has been lost due to the cost of inflation um, since FY21, just in delivering those projects. Um, and that leaves a lot of people in limbo. Uh, grant applications, particularly for those big transformative projects like the IIJ envisaged, are a huge investment of time. Uh, it's a huge drain on resources, um, and it's a high-risk, high-reward scenario. Um, you know, but it's also difficult to imagine putting out these projects incrementally, uh, only to realize that the bid's coming back, that funding might only cover a half to a third of the projects identified. Um, you know, so more than ever, DOTs are, are being asked to stretch every dollar to prioritize effectively and to find opportunities to achieve multiple objectives. Um, you know, and I think we have to take a good hard look uh, at whether we have the data to do that on the safety side. Um, you know, I think it's interesting that the only real mention of a systemic approach in IIJA is the section on resiliency improvement plans, um, you know, and, and resiliency and systematic assessment of risk really go hand in hand. 
Um, and so the, it isn't the question that you asked here uh, to answer the question posed in the title, is there a you know, price tag on safe, resilient roads? Um, you know, and, and maybe I'd even argue there's a, an element of redundancy to, to safe and resilient. Um, you know, the nominal price tag may be established by Congress in the coming weeks and months. But for the individual DOT, it's more of a negotiation. Um, you know, where are my opportunities to achieve safety objectives through non-traditional avenues? How can I multiply my safety dollars or achieve systemic improvements through my organization's other activities? Um, you know, can I benefit from data aimed at assessing systemic risk and acting uh, proactively where issues are predicted to occur um, or to develop a plan for acting, you know, when those issues inevitably come to pass? rather than reacting once the issues you know, quite literally pile up. Um, you know, so safety and safety data can be woven into each phase of a DOT decision making to help optimize the funding made available by IIJA. Um, you know, in that way, safer roads aren't reliant on the presence or absence of a particular programmatic line item, um, and safety data can ensure that the most far-reaching and effective projects are prioritized and, and critical safety functions maintained even when funding um, is in flux. That's great, thank you, Ryland. Um, so kind of building on that kind of theme of resiliency and following on from your points, Andrew, on you know, IIJA investment opportunities, um, I wanna talk about um, the bridge investment program. So the bill also included a bridge investment program that amounted to an investment of uh, uh, 12.5, billion dollars over five years. Yeah. Um, as we know, there are circumstances in recent years, such as in Kentucky and Minnesota, and more recently, the I-95 bridge collapse in Philadelphia, where the bridge resiliency has failed, mm -hmm. impacting not just the economy uh, locally, but also nationally. Um, what can you tell us about changes that need to happen on a national level? Well, you know, I appreciate that. And I think there's a couple of things. I think on the bridge side in general, um, you know, we've been strong proponents of additional money for bridges. Uh, we've sent, we, we actually were happy to see in the Senate language um, for the uh, FY24 budget that they did include an additional, I think, $1.21 billion um, in general fund money for bridges. Uh, because there's a huge problem with bridges that are structurally deficient um, throughout the country. And, you know, addressing that is going to need more than just what we put in IIJA for that. So I think that's really important. And, I, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that the Congress is, sees the importance of that. Uh, when we talk about what happened in Philadelphia, I think there's a couple of things we can take away. And they were similar to what we also saw in Minnesota and, and Louisville. I mean, Minnesota is obviously a, a tragedy, you know, they were all tragedies in, in Minnesota, you know, the bridge collapsed over a river. But I think one of the things that we saw out of that, what we're seeing in Philadelphia is, you know, the re initial reactions from DOT, US DOT was, this is gonna take months to fix. Um, and I think people were, you know, this is a major corridor going through a major US city, the East Coast of the United States is heavily trafficked, especially on 95. So, you know, the idea of shutting down that section for months, um, was just not acceptable. And I think the, the I applaud the governor of Pennsylvania and others who were able to get this project, you know, back where we had six sections open in I think 12 days. Um, and how did they do that? They worked around the clock. They kind of, as I said earlier, they didn't ignore the permitting process, but they streamlined the process to focus on getting access available early. Now, the other good thing, and, and I think this is one of the reasons why we're talking about resiliency today is, and, you know, in the in the case of Philadelphia, you still had an additional kind of major thoroughfare with the Delaware Memorial Bridge and the New Jersey, New Jersey Turnpike to allow for people to move around this, you know, section of bridge that was lost in North Philly. If we didn't have that, if this was the only route going from north to south in the East Coast on 95, the amount of impact this would have on every American, not just locals who were you know, traveling to and from work in Philadelphia, but trying to get goods and services moved up and down the, the, the Northeast, that would have been paralyzing to our economy for a very significant time and months or, of waiting would have really been a problem. So I think in Minnesota, we saw the same thing. I think they rebuilt that bridge over the river in a year. Um, so, you know, I think what we've seen is we can redo projects, we can avoid you know, we can get projects built if the will is there to do them quickly. And the, some of the what we do in permitting and some of what we do just slows the process down. So if we can build in resiliency by adding additional, 
you know, routes for major corridors so that if we do have another tragic situation, we can still, you know, not have a major backlog on our, on our supply chain, but we can all, and people can move up and down the coast or wherever it may be. But we also have the idea that we can get projects built faster and getting those benefits out to the people sooner. And I think that was a, that's been a, one of the big takeaways I hope we can take from this tragedy in Philadelphia is that we can build these projects quicker and provide, you know, the needs to the people faster. Thanks, Andrew. You, you've made some interesting points there that I'm going to just hand back to Ryland in a second. So um, we've discussed kind of resiliency. We've discussed, um, you know, really focusing on, you know, critical uh, rebuilding. Um, and we've discussed uh, critical investments within a limited funding pool. So, Ryland, can I ask you, how do you prioritise whether the constraints of deferred maintenance, increasing project costs and the like? Yeah, I mean, I, I like I like the Philadelphia example for for two reasons. You know, just as Andrew cited, you know, first of all, it you know demonstrated um, you know as the the governor kind of called out the things that he felt like allowed them to move this project forward. You know, the things that he cited uh, were you know the kind of change in approvals process, permitting um, you know quick synchronized decision making, engineering creativity, and coordination. Um, you know, those were kind of his keys to how they got they got this work done in, in 12 days, as opposed to reopening in, you know, months, six months, many months, um, you know, and uh, along with that, the general expectation and whatever the initial time set, um, you know, it would be admired in delays that would drag on beyond that. Um, you know, so one one thing is that, you know, they they highlighted the the role of kind of, you know, maybe moving some of those things along differently in a state of emergency, um, you know, which, you know, I, I am going to argue that, uh, you know, we shouldn't wait for those kinds of emergencies to, to happen. You know, this is something, these are lessons we can apply to multiple phases of the, the work that we're doing um, before an emergency is realized. Um, but in addition to that, you know, the, the other principles that, that he called out, you know, the, the unique situation here where there was resiliency in place, I think it's an endorsement of both the idea of having resiliency, why it's important, um, you know, from the get go, but also how, you know, in, in choosing to think differently about this problem um, through this kind of different uh, form of quick synchronized decision making and creativity and coordination, you know, I think a lot of folks have have gotten kind of bogged down in the process as well. And this really emphasizes, I think, how shaking up that process a little bit, um, you know, can can really have a huge impact. So, you know, I think the the short answer, Abby, uh, is how do you prioritize <laughs> within a number of constraints is, is with great difficulty. Um, you know, the longer answer is with great difficulty but clear intention. Um, you know, we spent a whole pandemic learning that safety and resiliency don't take care of themselves. Um, and we're not going to luck into the right answers, but we can be intentional with our safety and resilience goals, uh, resiliency goals. And, and one way that we can do that is uh, through the use of robust predictive data. Um, and when it's analyzed systemically, that can and should help us anticipate where on our network we're at the greatest risk of failure. Um, you know, if that's a, you know, qu a question of resiliency, you know, data like, uh, you know, traffic flows, traffic volumes, economic corridors, understanding that if any section of that goes away, you know, some type of redundancy needs to be built in. Um, but robust predictive data, you know, yes, also like continuous friction data can tell us which conditions of the network are likely to indicate early failures um, the conditions in which early failures arise or how long we have until an expected failure. Um, you know, and by using the ideas that, you know, Pennsylvania's governor has laid out using engineering creativity and coordinating across bodies, you know, we can potentially avoid it becoming an emergency situation, um, you know, and we can call it the, the PA model. Yeah, I, I think Ryland brings up a lot of really important points. I think the the greater use of data to determine where our problem areas are is essential. I think I, I think more states need to start incorporating this different technologies to understand what's going on in their roads. I, I think what we're also dealing with from a, from a DC kind of national perspective is, you know, a lack of interest in adding capacity to our highway system. Um, you know, 
I hate to point, you know, to pile on the administration, but, you know, one of the first things they did in 2021 was that after IAJA was, was passed was they put out a memo saying now it's since been revoked, but they were going to prior, they wanted states to prioritize fixing existing capacity and not adding capacity. And I think that was a big problem and mistake because it, it it tells states that you shouldn't be adding capacity that the dot does not want you adding capacity to your roads does not want you to be adding you know secondary routes in case of a cat cast track failures um or just to have you know maybe you have commuter routes that are more readily used by the driving public and you also have freight routes that are more used by you know trucks and last day last minute last hour delivery groups whatever it may be but you know i think as we're seeing the economy change, as we're seeing a lot more kind of reliance on home deliveries and more goods being moved by truck, we need to be able to accommodate that. And I think telling states that they shouldn't be investing, you know, they shouldn't be investing in new routes and thinking big to how to better streamline the, their highways. I, I think that is just contrary to the needs of the country. I think that's one of the big arguments we've been making um in our implementation of iija is you know we need to make sure that we are adding capacity to current roads and adding new routes um and as i said fortunately when uh, administrator bat came in he was you know he thankfully rescinded the the fix the first memo and gave states more flexibility but you know there's a lot that's being done that will slow down the process or just dis or dis discourage greater investment in new roads and new capacity and new resiliency I think that's that's an important thing we all need to be arguing for. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Ryland. You've raised some interesting points. And we do have a question from the audience that I'm just kind of ties in with what you've been saying. So I'd just like to kind of uh, raise it now. Um, so are there states, and you have touched on this, are there states that do a better job than others in keeping their roads safe and resilient? Um, and what kind of policies do they have in place to make it happen? How does data play a role in this? And as I said, you have touched on this, but have you got anything more to add? That question's from Carl. Um, yeah, so so I can go back to this idea of, of activities meeting multiple objectives, um, you know, and, and safety and resiliency potentially as it's framed in that question, you know, being one of them, but, but multiple objectives as a way of increasing the efficacy of dollars. Um, you know, there are a number of states uh, Kentucky and Virginia kind of spring to mind most immediately that use a ranking methodology to inform project investment based on perceived need and factors like congestion reduction and increased accessibility and contribution to economic development, land use and the like. Um, in this scenario, safety might inform how the project gets delivered, whether it can be, you know, done safely, but it's not the driver of the project, you know, rather for most DOTs, safety projects are the domain of the safety team. Um, I think, you know, in terms of, you know, prioritizing and using data to help address, you know, kind of from the, the fundamental challenges of our network and, you know, to, to kind of future-proof the network we have to see, instead, how can the safety team's priorities be folded into regularly scheduled maintenance activities? Um, you know, something that, that touches not only a single project, but potentially affects large swaths of the network. Um, you know, I, in terms of resiliency, there was some legislation passed here in Virginia in 2021 that asked VDOT to consider the resiliency uh, or consider resiliency when writing its statewide transportation plan. Um, and it specifically amended the document, the project application to include whether the project sponsor um, you know, is committed to the idea that the design will be resilient, um, but it actually doesn't impact the, the final ranking smart scale score. So this is the smart scale model for anyone who's familiar with it. Um, so, you know, they're asked to, to say whether or not it's resilient, but it actually doesn't affect whether or not that particular project gets, gets developed or pushed along. Um, should it, right? You know, should resiliency as such be given equal weight to economic development given, you know, the clear economic impact of losing access to that facility in portion or entirety? Um, you know, so those are the kinds of, of questions that I think, um, you know, folks, should be asking around, you know, whether or not, you know, safety or resiliency, um, you know, what kind of 
whether states are, are really seriously uh, engaging with those as they think about the future of, of their network. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you totally. I think there's some states, uh, I won't name names because. You know, <laughs> That's fine. I, I, I put my neck out there. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> it's a little more political. I think, uh, <laughs> I, I think there are definitely some states that are much more interested in, in doing their own thing and finding out, you know, how we incorporate more data into our system. And I think they've been really good at partnering with local universities, in, you know, individual companies, whoever it may be out there. Um, and they're really trying to, um, you know, find new and innovative ways of, of how we kind of address safety and freight efficiency and whatever it may be in our highway system, how we design all that. And I think that there, there are other states that are frankly probably waiting on the US DOT to tell them you have to do it this way. I think they're just, this is how we've done it. And a lot of what's out there, you know, they're not sure about. It. They're not sure about placing, you know, data sensors on all on roads because it just hasn't been how they've done it. And I think they want the US DOT. And I think, you know, part of that is on us to continue to talk to Congress and DOT on why we need to incorporate this more into our system so that some of these states that have been more hesitant, um, you know, are willing to do it. And I think you know, it's just kind of the parochial nature of states. Now, again, I think, but at the same time, the, the state DOTs are much better at kind of determining how to prioritize projects and what's best for their state than, you know, some of these grant, just more discretionary grant programs that don't necessarily always, you know, they're, they're not as familiar with the federal system. They're not as familiar with the whole process of getting money out allocated. And that slowed down the process more generally. Yeah. So, so let me, let me make political amends if I have to any states out here by, um, you know, uh, again, emphasizing how good this, uh, this newly named PA model is, um, you know, where, whereby the, the state is, is shaking things up. Um, you know, we prefer all things equal that, you know, things be shaken up and, and maybe some of this proactive, uh, approach be taken before we get to the point of, of an emergency. But, you know, in effect, the, the PA model, newly named, uh, you know, is, is a risk man management strategy um, where a failure to support safety and resiliency can create emergencies among the organization's other priorities. Um, you know, they, they spent who knows at this point how much money uh, to get the, the bridge reopened within 12 days as opposed to six months. Um, it was not something that their budget had anticipated. So, so now they're going to be figuring out where they're going to pay for the rest of that for the rest of the year. Um, but other priorities as well, you know, and, and how safety and resiliency kind of directly impede, for example, um, you know, congestion reduction or accessibility or economic development goals that may be prioritized within, um, you know, the models like smart scale in, in Kentucky and Virginia. Um, you know, so I, I, I really see the need for, for kind of three things. You know, one, robust and predictive data to anticipate the need. Um, you know, we, we don't want our pavements in a functional failure state, not least because it's tied to federal funding, because it's, it's a requirement of, of the federal government. Um, you know, so why should we want our pavements to be in a functional failure state from a safety perspective? Um, you know, two, adopting a risk management strategy that identifies safety and resiliency goals as both independent of and key to achieving um, other organizational goals, whether those goals be delivering and maintaining high quality facilities that manage the free flow of the U.S. economy with minimal disruption or congestion, or, you know, the good stewardship of, of taxpayer funds. And three, you know, emphasizing that um, the impact of safety and resiliency investments are multiplied when they are distributed across the organization. You know, construction materials and maintenance can all contribute to something like safety uh, through their efforts. Um, you know, and I've heard a lot over the past few years uh, of organizations saying that that safety is their number one priority. Oh. But what does that mean? Uh, you know, how, how is safety being woven into the metrics or key performance indicators of each business unit? You know, how and where is safety fitted into the organization's decision making? Um, you know, that's, I, I, 
for for you know the kind of historic investment that that IJA is, um, you know, I think we're remiss if if we continue to invest at historic levels in the old ways of doing business. Um, you know, we've really got to to shift to these these new ways of business to to make the best use of the funding available for us. Thank you, Ryland. Um, so you've given us your kind of three sort of key areas for change. Andrew, um, to finish, um, can yeah. you give us three policy prescriptions for change from your point of view? Yeah, I think um, probably the biggest one, as I've mentioned a couple of times, is permanent reform. I think, you know, Congress is working on additional permanent reform um, just to speed up speed up the process and i think that's going to be essential in making sure that our dollars are spent more on roads and less on the process to get to the road i think additionally um you know more going through formula programs less discretionary grants um gives states more autonomy to kind of make sure that the money's getting out quicker um and you have you know larger projects funded that way but I think finally, I think a lot of what we talked about with resiliency and a lot of uh, in terms of getting more data out there to understand where our problems are and be able to allocate, you know, more, you know, attention to those problems to, to deal with so we don't have these huge catastrophic issues in the future. Um, I think that's gonna be really critical. And I think just more adoption of, you know, spectrum to the highway system, um, data collection sources, all the different things we're learning in terms of how we can add efficiency to our highways be really important. And I think that's something, you know, we're already looking towards the next highway bill. I think more, um, more connectivity in the highway system in some kind of a safety title in the next highway bill um, will be critical in making sure that, you know, we have a much more efficient system. And I think, you know, there's a lot there that I think we've only scratched the surface on a lot of what we can do. Um, I mean, you mentioned, I think you said 80,000 accidents um, at the start of this. I think, you know, there's a lot we can do to reduce that number. Um, you know, we've, we've seen uh, distracted driving and vehicle ca casualties going up year after year. And a lot of that is due to distracted driving. So what we can do to kind of add more connectivity and add more, you know, more um, alert systems, and safety into the roads will be critical for, you know, making sure that people you know, get home safe every day. And I think that's something we can really focus on in, in the next highway bill as well. That sounds like a great place to, to, to finish the discussion. So thank you both. There were some great, um, really interesting points that were raised and your contributions to both the debate and the future of Highways Network is, is valuable. So thanks very much. Um, thanks for joining us and thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, look forward to next time.